Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming down today. Dr. Loyal. Loyal. Dr. Loyal. I had a friend named Loyal. Um, Lori Hale is going to talk to us with a three part series on Bonhoeffer today. We're very excited about that. Um, in fact, I've told this story already twice today. Um, the last time she was here, she mentioned that she was going to speak to us for an hour, but there was a 50-hour class that she was going to <laughs> give us in an hour. And after we left, Ben said, we should just schedule her for 49 more weeks. <laughs> now, that's a big deal for a 13-year-old to be excited about. Uh, we are missing a cable in spite of the $100 of cables I bought for the room. <laughs> Uh, we're missing a Mac cable, so Pastor Jason's on his way up there to get that, and then uh, we'll get going. But, Lori, do you want to begin anyway? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Well, good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for um, having me back. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm excited to be here for, um, for three weeks in a row. So I'll be here today and the next two Sundays. So I see some familiar faces. I know some folks. Thanks for being here. And I see some familiar faces from... The last time I was here, I appreciate you coming back. So when I was here in the fall, I did kind of an overview narrative of, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's life. And uh, 50 minutes is not very much time to, to, to do the story justice. And so I, let's see if we got the, the picture yet. Ooh, there we go. Oh, thank you. a miracle worker. All right. Thanks. Um, and so we didn't get a lot of time to talk, to really go into any detail on some of the theological themes or some of the questions that are really pertinent in thinking about why Bonhoeffer is relevant um, today. So as, as Enid and I um, spoke um, about coming back, we decided uh, to, to divide this into several um, kind of blocks of time. And so um, and so today I want to dig into some of the theological themes. Um, next week we'll talk a little bit about the reception of Bonhoeffer and the uses and abuses of his legacy. And then the, the last week we will um, entertain this question that's kind of a live question in public discourse right now. Um, is this a Bonhoeffer moment? And what does that mean? And so they're related, there's going to be overlap, we can circle back and um, try to see how all of these different conversations connect. Um, I'd like to get you a little bit more involved in the conversation, and so I may, I may, um, I may move into classroom mode and sort of throw some questions to you. And I know that um, there's kind of a range of um, familiarity with Bonhoeffer. So some of you may be quite familiar, have studied him, thought about him. Some of you may still be going, wait, who is this guy again and what did he do? So I'm going to try to find that middle ground to help everybody stay engaged, right? So if you've thought about Bonhoeffer a lot, I want to try to entertain your questions and get your input. And if you're still learning a lot, I want to make sure you're not left behind. So um, think about today and next week and the following week as interactive sessions. Feel free to ask questions and um, we're going we're gonna to go from there. Um, actually, you had asked. I brought index cards, so I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to Enid and Ruth, and if you would, um, I'm gonna hand these out. If you have questions along the way and want to jot them down, if you're not feeling comfortable raising your hand, which is also okay, um, I'm gonna have these available to you so that we can either take I can take questions today in this format, or I can take them with me and uh, come back to them when we get together again next week. Um, <clears throat> so. Oops, oh, I gotta turn it on. All this technology. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna uh, be able to repeat the whole story of Bonhoeffer's life, but I wanted to put the conversation about his theological themes in context. So as a refresher for those of you who were here before, I'm gonna use some of the same pictures and just give you a brief um, uh, word or two about moments in his life and then we'll stop and land on the places where he's starting to work out particular ideas. So we know that Bonhoeffer was born in 1906 and was um, 
executed at the hands of the Nazis in 1945 when he was only 39 years old. He grew up in a very close-knit family of eight. Here's a picture of uh, Bonhoeffer right here, Dietrich with his siblings and his mother. Um, I pointed out this is a picture of him in his uh, younger years. And the death of his older brother Walter in World War I was very instrumental in his thinking about theological questions and existential questions. Um, so he studied, so I'm going to stop, I'm going to pause here. So at the ripe old age of 21, he finished his doctoral dissertation. Um, it's still shocking every time I say that. Um, but in his dissertation called Sanctorum Communio, or the Communion of Saints, he worked out some really important ideas about community and about Christ existing as community and about the relationship of people to each other. And so one of the things that he um, wrestled with in this moment was this idea that we want to talk about the incarnation of Christ. We understand that Christ is the incarnation of God, the self-revelation of God to the world, but where does that go on? Where does that keep happening in time, over time? And he says it happens in community. That when we encounter another, we encounter Christ. We see, the, we see Christ in the face of the other. And so there's a lot of work going on in this dissertation that continues to resonate throughout the rest of his life. But the one idea I want you to take away um, uh, from this is this idea that we encounter when we encounter the other, he says the other places an ethical demand on us and we are called to respond. So this is in contrast to other um, ways that people had been thinking philosophically about the relationship between I and other. So if you go back, if you look at the Enlightenment, you look at some of the philosophers that were um, writing before um, Bonhoeffer, you see people talking about the encounter with the other as being important insofar as the other person reflects your own eye, that you learn something about yourself in that encounter. And Bonhoeffer switched that up and said the other is important as other. There's integrity, there's importance to the other, uh, independent of who you are and whether or not it reflects your own self. Um, but so that encounter then, when you meet another, the other places an ethical demand on you and you are called to respond. So I want you to hang on to that. That's all I'm going to say. There's a lot more. We could, we could sp spend a lot of time talking about the dissertation, but I just wanted to plant that seed because it, it's going to relate um, to some of the things that he has to say later. Okay, so then he went off to study. Again, I'm going to sort of um, fast forward through the biography. Again, this might jog some of your memories. He spent a year in New York City at Union Theological Seminary, um, studied with Reinhold Niebuhr, who was a, an ethicist, right? Um, sort of the father of modern social ethics. Had a friendship, a very important friendship, with a French student named Jean Lasserre, who was a pacifist. Had a very important friendship with Albert Franklin Fisher, who was an African-American student from Alabama, he learned firsthand about racism in America. He got involved with his friend at, there at the Abyssinian Baptist Church on Harlem, which was an African-American church. Again, the things he was learning in class with Reinhold Niebuhr about preaching with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other, was being lived out in the kind of ministry and, and um, a worship style and uh, importance of taking seriously social justice issues that was happening at Abyssinian. Um, he went back to Germany and was ordained at St. Matthew's Church in Berlin. Hitler came to power. Again, we have to remember that when we read Bonhoeffer, we're always reading him in context. And so January 30th of 1933, Hitler was appointed chancellor, and of course that changed a lot of things. That's an understatement. Um, in April of 1933, you have the Jewish boycott. So again, Hitler, when I talk to my students, and I said this probably when I was here before, but when I talk to my students um, about this period of time and I ask them, you know, when did Hitler uh, come to power, they often associate Hitler with the war and the Holocaust and they start, they think, late 30s, early 40s. Um, 
he came 1933, and, and things started the, the sort of the systematic dehumanization of the Jews and the building of the camps, and all of the things that we associate, you know, with sort of later in the 1930s started happening right away. So, um, April 1st, 1933, was the Jewish boycott of all Jewish businesses throughout Germany. Um, Bonhoeffer writes an important essay. Uh, actually, it's a speech that is also an essay called Church and a Jewish Question in 1933. He delivered this um, address to a group of pastors. And he takes on some really important themes in this address related to the relationship of the church and the state. And so, um, we, again, this is something we could tease. We could, we could spend our whole hour on this essay. The case was all of this material, right? Um, but, you know, the, in his mind, he, 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 he uh, had inherited and, um, and adopted a Lutheran understanding of the doctrine of two kingdoms, which put the church and the state in a particular kind of relationship. They had different spheres of responsibility, different spheres of authority, and they were related and distinct. Um, but the, church, um, the church's uh, job was to sort of make sure the state was doing its job, but not to dictate what that looked like. But he said in this particular address, he said, if the state is failing to do its job, right, if the state is either exercising too little or too much power, the church has the right and the responsibility to do something, to say something. If the church is um, uh, causing harm to people, including people who aren't Christians, the church has the right and the responsibility to take action. And he says, if the church, or, sorry, if the state, um, uh, again, if the state is not doing its job, too much power, harming people, the church has the right and the responsibility not only to, to help the victims of the state, whether or not they're Christian, the, the church has the right and the responsibility to seize the wheel of the state or to jam the spokes of the wheel of the state. We have heard this language before in relationship to Bonhoeffer. So he's calling for direct political action, not necessarily violent action, um, but action nonetheless. And um, this was radical. This was a radical statement, um, so much so that the pastors he was addressing when he gave this address got up and left the room. Um, so I'll just say there's some interesting translation challenges with this particular um, a, a work. Sometimes you'll read the English translation that says he calls for the, the church uh, to put a spoke in the wheel. That doesn't make any sense. If you put a spoke in the wheel, the wheel just keeps turning. Um, so this is more the idea that you jam the spokes of the wheel. Um, I like to picture my brother on a bicycle riding by, you know, and I have a big stick, you know, you stick it through my poor brother. You stick it, you know, you stick the... Just a Bonhoeffer moment, right? He goes flying over the handlebars. Um, all right. Um, he took some churches in London. This is in 1934. Um, he left Germany. This is one of the churches that he would have um, preached at. It's not one of the churches that he uh, pastored. Those churches actually were um, destroyed, but he uh, preached there. Then he um, was the director of the seminary of the Confessing Church at Finkenwalde. <coughs> So, again, I'm, I'm really fast-forwarding through the biography, but if you recall, um, as, uh, as Hitler came to power, the National Socialists took um, control, as it were, of the German church, the Deutsche Kirche. They elected Ludwig Mueller as the Reich bishop. They created a Reich church, a state church. Um, and this presented a problem not only for Bonhoeffer, but 7,000 of his closest friends in the Emergency Pastors League, who had tried to stop the election of Ludwig Miller, were unsuccessful. Um, so in April of 1933, there was a, a, a legislation that prohibited anyone of Jewish ancestry from holding public office. By the fall of that year, similar language had been adopted by the German church prohibiting anybody with German ancestry who was a pastor from um, holding the pulpit. Sorry, Jewish ancestry. Thank you. Was a, I misspoke. Thank you. So anyone, so, so his friend Franz Hildebrandt, for example, um, who was an ordained 
pastor but had Jewish um, family was no longer allowed to um, hold his pastoral office. And so, um, and so uh, the Emergency Pastors League came together and created the Confessing Church. And in the Confessing Church, um, they confessed that Jesus Christ was Lord and no other. Of course, the subtext, the unwritten subtext of that was right, and not Hitler. And they opened a seminary where young men at the time who wanted to uh, go into the ministry but did not want to sign a loyalty oath to Hitler could go and train for their pastoral work. And so Bonhoeffer uh, was still in London when this all happened, but he was invited to come and direct the seminary. He had to make a decision because he had already made arrangements to go to India and study with Gandhi and learn more about nonviolent resistance. So he had to choose go to India or go back to Germany, and he chose to go back to Germany. So this, um, this is a pretty famous part of his life, and so um, two books that are really well known related to Bonhoeffer, Discipleship and Life Together, are related to this time at Finkenwalde. Um, he met Eberhard Betke uh, while he was there. He was one of the first students. They became fast friends. He became his best friend, his theological confidant. And, and later than Bonhoeffer's biographer, we can come back and talk a little bit more about Eberhard Betke. But while he was there is when he wrote Discipleship. So I want to, here's, I really want to pause here and spend some time talking about Discipleship and Costly Grace. So you may be familiar with this book with its earlier English title, which was The Cost of Discipleship. Um, uh, it's now in the new, so there's new English translations of all of Bonhoeffer's works that look like this. And in the new translations, um, instead of being called the cost of discipleship, it's called just discipleship. The original German title is Nachfolger, literally means following after, which is discipleship, right? When you follow after someone, you're a disciple. So um, I think the earliest translators in English were trying to get this idea of costly grace, which is the key concept in the, in the text, into the title. So right, they put in this... They made the title, you know, The Cost of Discipleship. So, this is, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this, this idea of costly grace, because I'm sure if you've heard about Bonhoeffer, this may be one of the things that you've heard about. But before we do that, we have to do a little, re a little review, right? We need to talk about justification. We need to talk about, what's that? What is it? So let me ask you, if I say the word justification, we're talking theolo theologically speaking. What? How would you define justification? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Acceptable to God. Acceptable to God. Being, set right. Being set right. I learned it as just as if I'd never sinned. Oh, just as if I'd never sinned. So there's a little mnemonic trick in that. So you connect it to the word. So. Um, Exactly. I think, I mean, in, in, in all of these ways, you can say um, in very simple terms, it's sort of being lined up with God, being acceptable to God, being right in the eyes of God, just as if I had never sinned. And so I like to, um, I think about now, a lot of us in this room are old enough to remember typewriters. Um, um, some of us more are probably more used to, accustomed to word processors and computers, but if you're typing, if you're typing a paper, and you're thinking about your margins, right? Lining up on the left or lining up, what is that called? Justified. Justified, right? You have left justified margins or right justified margins or both sides are justified. So again, it's about getting lined up. But we've got different ideas uh, historically about how that happened and what that looked like. So if we, if we go back and think about the, um, the traditional Catholic understanding of justification, the one that Augustine put forward, the transformative doctrine of justification, then um, we, we, we have to ask this question, well, what is it in that, in that view? So the, the key concept we're working with now is grace. So let's talk about grace. If I'm going to ask you, what do you, how do you define grace? What's that? Undeserved goodness. Undeserved goodness. Confirmation. <laughs> Undeserved love. Gift. 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 
Yeah, so gifts, so grace is this gift from God. So it's a gift from God. It's, we could, it's tied up with the gift of Jesus' sacrificial gift, right? Jesus died on behalf of all humanity to give us this undeserved gift of mercy, of forgiveness. But in the and so Augustine, what do you know about Augustine? Let's, we're we're really going old school here. What what do you know about Augustine? I promise this relates to Bonhoeff. He stole an orange, I think. A pear. Yeah. Close. Sorry. A pear. He was throwing pears at pigs, is what he was doing. He felt really bad about it. Yeah. But for, you were in the right ballpark. Fruits. Yeah, yeah it's good. Yeah, work with me here. <laughs> so, Augustine, um, what kind of life, well, what's his most, so in that, your, your reference to the orange, do you, know, you remember what book that's from? Oh, yeah. What's it called? What's the title? No idea. No idea. <laughs> Confessions. Oh, yeah. He wrote a book, Confessions. So if you write a book called Confessions, what does that indicate to you about the kind of life you've led? <laughs> pretty raucous. Yeah, raucous. So Augustine had lived this pretty raucous, I like that word, raucous life. He, he had a conversion experience late in life. And he understood that this gift from God, this gift of grace, in his mind was transformative. Because he had to, when he made this, when he had this conversion, when he came to this understanding that he had this gift, he had to change the way he was living, because he had been living this raucous life. He literally had to repent, which means to turn around, to go the other direction, and do things differently. So for Augustine, he said that gift of grace from God is transformative. It transforms your willing your thinking and your believing so that you can act in such a way as to be right in the eyes of God. Okay? Everybody with me so far? All right. Now, you know, forgiveness and all that other, you know, it's part of the mix, but this is the key takeaway. Luther comes along 1,200-ish years later, right? What do we know about Luther? What tradition did he grow up in? Catholic. Catholic. Augustinian. Even better, right? So he grows up in this tradition. What do we know about the kind of life he led? What's that? Um, I wouldn't, I, later, we could talk about the, the, the things he does later in his life as being a little bit of a rabble rouser, but his life up to to that point was... Well, I think he was plagued by guilt. He was, he, he never felt that he could be good enough. He was, he was, he was just, um, no matter how much he prayed, no matter what he did, he felt like he wasn't measuring up. Absolutely. He never felt like he could measure up. He actually lived a pretty, he walked a pretty straight line. But he felt guilty. He felt like he could never do enough or be enough to be good enough in the eyes of God. He read that the righteous shall live by faith, and he thought, I have to be righteous before I can have faith. I'll never get there. He went to confession every day. The confessor said, why are you here? You're wasting our time. <laughs> Your time, my time. And so, because he, he, he was sort of steeped in that idea that that gift of grace transformed you, that you had to think and act and and be something in the eyes of God that you had to do yourself based on that gift. And he said, this is, you know, this isn't it. I can't do it. And so he prayed and he studied and he studied scripture and he came to the conclusion that that gift was completely unmerited. That gift of grace was a gift from God that was absolutely utter forgiveness and mercy and then, so this is where we get justification by grace through faith alone. If you believe, if you declare your faith, you are justified. Right, so Augustine, we have the transformative doctrine of justification. Luther, we have the declarative doctrine of justification. Now, how you live your life, maybe will have a little bit of, uh, hopefully it'll have an impact, but that was secondary, right? So now you have these two kind of competing positions. 
And so when people critique, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna pick a fight with somebody, what are you gonna do? You're gonna push that position to its most extreme conclusion to, to argue with it. So if we're looking at the Catholic, the Augustinian version, what's the critique? What's the problem? But that can't measure up. You can't well in the the if if we're standing I'm going to flip that around. If we're standing in the um, Lutheran position, looking at the Catholic position, where you've been transformed and you have to act in a way that's right with God, that means you have to earn your own salvation. This is the works righteousness critique, right? You have to do stuff to be saved. But if you're standing in that position, looking over at the Lutheran, the declarative, what's the critique here? What's that? It's pure gift, and you don't have, there's no accountability. You're lazy. You're off the hook. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is say, I believe, please forgive me, and you, there's no accountability, right? So Bonhoeffer, see, I told you we'd come back to Bonhoeffer. So Bonhoeffer, who has now is, is coming out of the Lutheran tradition, um, again, is starting from the Lutheran doctrine of justification, the declarative doctrine of justification, he says, you know what? There's some truth in this critique. If, if, if this gift of grace doesn't transform us at all, if it doesn't change the way we live in the world and act in relationship to others, it is cheap grace. It is, it is forgiveness without repentance. Right? It is um, discipleship without communion. It is, you know, it is, it's empty. And so he says, um, he says, we, in fact, need to find something that's somewhere in the middle. He wants to start there, but he says it's going to cost us something, and it is going to be transformative. It is going to change how we live. And so this is where he articulates this idea of costly grace which really kind of bridges the two, right? It kind of takes this middle position. What's interesting is that in, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the year, uh, about 15, 20 years ago, somebody in this audience might be able to tell me the year, um, the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation issued something called the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. 1999, thank you. And if you, um, and if you read that statement, it resonates very closely with Bonhoeffer's um, idea of costly grace. So um, let me just read, um, I'll just read a couple passages uh, for you about costly grace. Um, costly grace is the hidden treasure in the field Actually, I'm going to back up. I'm going to talk about cheap grace. Cheap grace is preaching forgiveness without repentance. It is baptism without the discipline of community. It is the Lord's Supper without confession of sin. It is absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without the living incarnate Jesus Christ. Costly grace is the hidden treasure in the field for the sake of which people go and sell with joy everything they have. It is the costly pearl for whose price the merchant sells all that he has. It is Christ's sovereignty for the sake of which you tear out an eye if it causes you to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ which causes a disciple to leave his nets and follow him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which has to be asked for, the door at which one has to knock. It is costly because it calls us to discipleship. It is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs people their lives. It is grace because it thereby makes them live. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. So those are some words of Bonhoeffer's from the book, the text of discipleship. Um, uh, I want to also say 
uh, uh, later in the, in the text, he's talking a little bit about Luther and a little bit about how um, Luther's move from the monastery back to the world, right? His idea that vocation is not something that happens in isolation from others, but happens in, in secular life, so to, so to speak. Um, he says, uh, Costly grace was given as a gift to Luther. It was grace because it was water onto thirsty land, comfort for anxiety. The grace was costly because it did not excuse one from works. Instead, it endlessly sharpened the call to discipleship. But just wherein it was costly, that was wherein it was grace. And where it was grace, that was where it was costly. That was the secret of the Reformation gospel, the secret of the justification of the sinner. So I just wanted to, to, to have you start thinking about this. Um, I think it's important, um, both in understanding Bonhoeffer, it gives us something for us to think about in terms of our own understanding of grace. Um, but it also um, provides a foundation for understanding some of Bonhoeffer's later uh, works and decisions. Because in the, at, the, at the end of the day, when he makes the decision to participate in the conspiracy, um, he leans very heavily into this idea of costly grace. Because part of being part of, uh, being part of that conspiracy, being part of the group that says, this is what we have to do in this time, in this moment, in this place, um, means that we take on guilt. He never tried to justify his actions. He never tried to say that, that killing someone, killing a tyrant even, right, is justified. He always said, it is a sin, and I have to hope and pray for God who will forgive me in this venture when I become a sinner in answering this call. And so that idea that grace is actually un, uh, unmerited forgiveness was really important for him to be able to take that particular step. And we can come back to that, but I mean, I just wanted to make that connection now. Do you have any questions about this before I move on? Yes. So that last part makes zero sense to me. What I just said? Yes. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you're not making sense, but it, I'm saying what he's saying makes sense. I was with you right up until then. Like, how can it be obligatory to sin? How can how can God lay on us an obligation to sin? That makes zero sense to me. Well, I think, I mean, so, so the question is, how can God make it obligatory to sin? How can God lay on us this, this call to sin? Again, context is so critical here. I would, I would hesitate to put it quite that way, that God puts this ob obligation on us to sin, but Bonhoeffer found himself in a situation where to act in the way that he chose to act was to be to, was to take on sin, and to not act was to take on sin. And so, um, you know, and, and that this actually speaks to, I mean, this is part of his, his ethics are so interesting in part because he really turns ethical um, decision making on its head. I mean, so, and what I mean by that is that in lots of systems of ethics, right, if you read other um, ethicists, they want to try to sort of present to you a set of ideas or principles that are good for all times and places, that are universal, right? Do not kill. Do not lie. You could make a long list. And that's appealing, and that's... And, and, we, and we need that to some degree, right? I mean, I teach my kids, don't, you know, don't lie to me, right? I think we've all heard that. On the other hand, there are particular places and times where that is not the most moral or ethical choice, right? right? And so Bonhoeffer really sort of drills down into the idea that particularity, particular concrete reality informs ethical decision making in conjunction with aligning yourself and being conformed to Christ. I mean, so I'm, I'm kind of getting my, ahead of myself here, but I think in, in this particular situation, um, I would, again, I would be hesitant to say that God puts that obligation on us to sin. He was in a situation that required him to act in a particular, in a, in, he required him to act, and the action 
was sinful. Does that, I don't know if that helps. I mean, it's, it's, a, confu it's a complicated situation, right? So I see it here as a question back here. I wonder if it comes down to uh, what would be the greater sin. When we see a tyrant who is destroying life, a thousand of lives, and do nothing about it, see it happening, and we do not do anything about it, to dethrone or to remove this person, maybe it's just for power or to, uh, to actually destroy him. I think the greater sin, uh, I just feel more comfortable in looking at it that way, that to do nothing would be a greater sin because this would just keep on going. And right. we have a voice, uh, we can we can do what we can with that voice, and if our voice is not enough, maybe we need to take a greater step and just trust in the grace of God. Right, so I think, um, just to, to recap, I mean, is, is there a greater or lesser evil, a greater or lesser sin, and when you're in a situation, how do you make that uh, adjudication? So um, Bonhoeffer, I think, found him in that exact situation, and he writes, explicitly in ethics about the fact that when you're making an ethical decision, it's very rare, maybe maybe almost never happens that you're gonna have a clear-cut good and a clear-cut evil. It's almost always gonna be the case that you're deciding between goods or between evils. And you have to do the best you can with what's in front of you. Which actually goes back to what I mentioned about the dissertation, but this idea that when you encounter another when you're faced with another, that other um, places an ethical demand on you to respond. And so in the situation that he was in, there were millions of others who were placing an ethical demand on him, who were, millions of others who were losing their lives, and he was called to respond on their behalf. Um, and so that, that gets factored in. Uh, Phyllis, well, I was just wondering, if you ever talked about the subcontrarial, Luther would talk about I don't know that he uses the language of the subcountry. He does use a lot of language about, um, there's a couple, he talks about the hidden discipline, the arcane discipline, which I think would align with that. Um, and he also talks, um, um, there's a lot of talk about the, um, the simultaneity of the yes and the no, that you have to, you know, that you're always saying yes and no at the same time. And it, we would need a lot of, we would need a little bit more than seven minutes to unpack that. <laughs> That's Bart coming through. Yeah, 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 it is Bart coming through. Yeah, there's something very dialectical going on in that moment. Yeah. Okay, any other comments? Um, okay, so uh, when the seminary closed, um, uh, he, it was closed by the Gestapo in 1937. Bonhoeffer left and um, put, the, again, this is a book you might be, have heard of or be familiar with, Life Together. This is an account of the time at the seminary. He wrote this book in about six weeks. Again, this man seemed to have, a, <laughs> have an ability to do things. Well, actually, his friends, his friends say that he could do in two hours what took most people about ten. So um, he had a, an intellect and a drive and a work ethic and I'm not sure what else, a magic wand or something that he could get things done. Um, but Life Together I think is a really um, interesting book where he, again, he describes what it was like to be in this community and and I think the things that he wrote about in his dissertation about community sort of on a philosophical level, he tried to put into practice in the community at Fink and Valda and he wrote about here. So. He talks about community in Sanctum Communio. He gives practical advice about how to sustain that kind of community when he writes about life together. He talks about having time alone and time together and time to pray. It was a very structured life. He actually was criticized that it was so structured. He was asked if he was trying to monasticize the seminarians. Um, and, and he said, no, absolutely not. I mean, in this difficult context of Nazi Germany, he wasn't actually trying to 
gives the seminarians a way to re retreat from the world. He was giving, trying to give them resources for going out into this environment and being able to do the work, having deep resources for renewal for themselves, deep resources for renewal for their communities, because otherwise it was going to be impossible to do their work. Um, but here's where he really hammers out some ideas about the importance of dialogue, that when we're in relationship with one another, it's dialogical, that, you, we, that we have to have that communication. And he also talks about it as being mediated by Christ. So this, again, there's some really strong ties between the dissertation and life together. Um, uh, I, would, I, would, I would maintain. November 9th, 1938, Kristallnacht, the night when Jewish businesses, synagogues, and homes were destroyed throughout Germany. This had a significant impact on Bonhoeffer. Um, it was a horrific night um, in and of itself. But the churches, the Deutsche Kirche, the German church, and the confessing church were both silent after this event. There was no work. And this was extremely disappointing to Bonhoeffer. I actually, um, in some of the things that I've written, I talk about from the beginning of his work until 1938, he writes very explicitly about loving one's enemies. It's in lo lots of his sermons, some of it shows up in uh, discipleship um, in a really sustained kind of way. After 1938, after Kristallnacht, he, he drops that language and starts talking instead about responsible action. So, um, again, something just for you to keep in, keep in mind. Um, he goes back to the United States in 1939 in June. Um, his family was already getting involved in some of the uh, conspiracy uh, that was happening within the German military intelligence. He had been restricted from speaking and writing. His friends in the United States knew he was in danger. Um, he went back. He had everything in order to stay safely. The war hadn't started yet, but it was imminent. And he could have stayed for the duration of the war in the US, but he never felt settled when he got to the US. He never felt like um, he was in the right place. He thought, if I'm going to be part of the reconstruction of Germany and Christendom and Europe after the conflict, after whatever's to come, I have to go back. So he only stayed for a month, and he took the last uh, uh, passage, the last boat back to Europe before they closed the Atlantic passageway. Um, he spent some time at the uh, Abbey, the, the Benedictine Monastery in Bavaria, in Atal. Um, and then he started working on his ethics. He's also getting involved in the conspiracy at this time. Um, but this is where he starts working on ethics and really um, working out this idea of Stellvertretung, which is this German word that's really hard to translate. Um, in the early English editions, it was called deputy ship, which, does that mean anything to anybody in this room? <laughs> um, and so it's no longer, that translation is no longer used. And so now it's translated in this mouthful, vicarious representative action. So that we are called as disciples of Christ to act vicariously on behalf of others. So in the same way that Jesus acted vicariously on behalf of us, as disciples, we are called to act vicariously on behalf of others, for those who have lost their voice and their power. And so if you think about his actions in the world, what he was doing, this is exactly what he was living out, was this idea of self Um and, uh, and again, this is a theme you can see the beginnings of this idea in the dissertation. It shows up, it shows up all along the way, but it start, he really starts to work this out when he's putting together um, the, ex, the ethics. He also works out in the ethics, um, uh, there's a section called the place of responsibility, and this is how he defines vocation. So he says vocation is responsibility, vocation as responsibility, that we are called um, to respond, uh, our whole, that we are called to respond with our whole life to the whole of the world. Um, and so I'm looking at my Augsburg colleague, Phil. We talk a lot about vocation with our students um, and what it means to be um, called to serve our neighbor, what it means to be um, uh, sort of find that, that sense of sort of aligning your skills and your passions with the needs of the world. 
And so for Bonhoeffer, this gets framed in the concept, and it's a very thick, rich concept of responsibility, and it gets tied back in with all these other theological themes, with, with uh, Stelver Tretum, with grace, um, because, because really we didn't, we didn't talk about um, this idea, and it should be, I think it would be familiar to you, this idea that grace then frees you up to act, right? So it's not a freedom from, you know, certain obligations, it's actually a freedom to, it's a freedom to be active in the world and with others. Um, uh, he also, as I was saying, he really turns <coughs> ethical thinking upside down so that um, he doesn't think it's possible to come up with universal principles that are always true for all times and all places. He thinks that you have to take concrete reality seriously, which is a reason why we can't take Bonhoeffer, this is where it gets complicated when we think about using Bonhoeffer as a model for our own thinking. He doesn't give us a template that we can just say, well, here's what Bonhoeffer did and said, so this is what I'm supposed to do and say. Because we have to always evaluate our own context. We have to do the work that he did in his context in our own situation and figure out what it is that we are called to do, what our responsibility is, how we are called to respond to the people that are in front of us. <coughs> that particularity is really important. Is it time? Is it time? Is it time? Yeah, no. it kind of is time. Okay, so I'm just looking at the clock, and this went really, really fast. <laughs> so what I would like to um, suggest is that if you have questions about anything we've talked about today, please put them on the index card. I hope you can all come back next week. Next week, I'm just gonna fast forward. Um, we will talk a, a little bit about um, letters and papers. We'll start with letters and papers from prison and his idea of religionless Christianity. This is the, the idea he was working out at the end of his life while he was writing from prison. And we'll try to connect some dots between that and everything else that he did. And then we'll move into a conversation about um, Kind of the reception of Bonhoeffer and the ways that Bonhoeffer is used by people across theological and the, the theological and political spectrum, because he's used widely by people from kind of every corner, um, and there's some controversy and there's some debate, and so we'll 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 take a look at that, um, and then uh, and then move again, as I said, the third week into this question: Is this a Bonhoeffer moment, and what in the world does that mean? So, thank you so much.